Hello and welcome to this week's episode of John's Garage. This week we're coming over all military and we're having a little look at this ex-British Army Land Rover 90. Okay, so a little bit about this particular vehicle here. It's important to know what its original reg plate in the army, in case anybody's watching this and actually drove this bad boy. Its original reg in the army was 68 KF57. Now, I have a couple of notes hidden here behind the spare wheel in case you're wondering why I'm looking over there. So that original reg again, 68 KF57. And this particular one was affectionately known in the army as Battle Axe. And the reason I'm able to tell that is you can look up using its original uh, reg number, its history. Now, a couple of other important points about this particular one's history. It spent the first few years of its life in the Welsh Guards. It then moved on to the Scottish Regiment. And then, mysteriously, 15 years of its life are classified. Now, from looking up at service records, we suspect it spent time overseas, but where it spent time, we're not actually sure. The other reason we suspect it spent time overseas is the chassis is perfect. It's rust-free, underneath is incredibly clean, and we know these were maintained to a very high standard, but it also makes sense that it was in a warm environment, okay? Now, what else have we got here? 2.5 litre four cylinder overhead valve engine underneath the bonnet, five speed manual, okay? Beam axle, solid axle up front, solid axle in the rear, but it's coil sprung. And that was the difference between the major difference between the Series 3 and the Land Rover 90 when it was released in 1984. What else? A couple of NATO upgrades on these, but I'll talk to you about those later on. But a couple of other little things which are important to note, okay? It is NATO compliant. So this was possible, possibly, on the battlefield with other NATO armies or in training with them. Okay, and I'll talk to you about a couple of the features underneath the bonnet and around the body which make this NATO compliant and we'll have a little look at those as well, okay? Anyway, you might be wondering, there's two little things in the front which aren't originally to spec. First of all is the Defender badge. It wouldn't have had one of those when it was in its original army spec. And second of all, a little tricolour down here. This is a ex-British Army one, so it actually would have been a Union Jack there, but the owner has lovingly upgraded that little symbol on the front. Of course, it is important to note that these were used by the Irish Army as well, so this will be very familiar to any ex-Army people, or even indeed people in the Army right now, when we have a little look around it, okay? So let's do that. Let's have a look under the bonnet. So folks, we're going to have a little look under the bonnet of this Land Rover 90, or it's got a Defender badge on the front. I must explain that actually for anyone who's really keen on this type of vehicle. Why has it got a Defender badge so this is a 1986 model it would have been def uh, badged a Land Rover 90 and that's it okay Defender badge was added later uh, during a very light little restoration and renovation here in Ireland but it shouldn't be there but anyway listen that's the front of the bonnet let's talk about underneath the bonnet okay so what have we got here we have a steel ladder frame chassis with a body on top body made of aluminium of course for protection and longevity Underneath the bonnet then, we have a 2.5 litre four-cylinder diesel engine, no turbocharge here. Also on top of that, we also have no power-assisted steering, so no power steering pump. Now, some of the upgrades, because this is a military spec one and it conforms to NATO standards, not just, we'll say, British military standards, it also comes with a 24-volt battery operated system. The reason for that is this particular vehicle would have been used in the field, would have carried radios, might have had extra heavy uh, trailers on with bigger lights and so on and so forth. So it needed to be able to power everything when it was out in the field. And of course, all NATO vehicles conform to the same standards so that any soldier from any army could jump in and be able to use this and expect the same things with it. A couple of other NATO specific items, of course, is the color. This is NATO green and so on and so forth. There's a couple of things like that. Now, more under the bonnet, it has a five-speed manual gearbox, also has a low and high ratio shifter as well in the cabin, and that's pretty much it. When we come to optional extras, there isn't really anything else. Now, it is worth mentioning that the engines and the drivetrain are upgraded over a normal civilian Land Rover. However, I'm going to be really level with you here, folks. When I looked up what it was, it was all technical, and I'll be honest, I couldn't quite understand it to be able to explain it. But anyway, that's underneath the bonnet of the Land Rover 90. So let's have a little look inside and see what that looks like. Okay, folks, you're very welcome to the interior of the Land Rover 90 ex-British Army. So as you'd expect, being an army vehicle, this is all about function over form. Creature comforts, they, ex they end with this slight cushion here on the seat, okay, on the vinyl seats, all right? What other conveniences do we have? Well, we have no radio. 
We have no entertainment system. There's definitely no touch screens in this. We have a map reading light. We have a switch here to open up the vent to allow fresh air in. We have a two speed van. We have a heater slide control over here and we can also adjust it to demist the window. It works not particularly effectively, but it is there. You have indicator switch, headlight switch and wash wipe. That's it. No power steering, as I already said, when we're under the bonnet. So this is full on manual here. OK, now. The driver of this particular one is quite lucky. It comes with a five-speed gearbox. There's a little bit more convenience or comfort with that. It also comes with a locking differential lever down here, and you also have high and low ratios. Now, one interesting feature, which is still here from its army days, is this rack, okay, for SA-80 assault rifles, okay? So essentially put the butt of the gun in there, clip it back here, and this clip holds it in place while the driver and passenger are driving about. It's also pointed up for safety, or the muzzle of the gun will also be pointing up for safety, just in case the weapon would accidentally deploy so that nobody would get injured. You might be wondering what this big massive knob is here in the middle. Obviously, a focal point of this car, it's his headlight switch. That's it. Turns on driving lights, turns on fog lights, as the owner has retrofitted them, and it also turns on your headlights when you're driving. That's it. The only other piece of convenience I can point out in here is a nice little bit of storage areas up there where you can throw in maybe, I don't know, your notebook or something while you're on duty. And that's pretty much it. Maybe a box of cigarettes if you're back in the olden days. This particular vehicle also carries a total of six passengers, two up the front, four in the back. So they will be soldiers with their weapons, with their bags and so on and so forth. The final thing to point out here is the rag top. These were known as rag tops, okay? Um, that can be taken off and that will reveal this massive and hefty anti-roll bar that's still fitted to the vehicle. And of course, this particular one has uh, seat belts as well, retrofitted onto that roll bar as well, obviously for safety and for conformity so that it can be used in the public roads. After that, the only other feature I can really point out is these lovely push slide side windows. So no roll down windows here. And again, a lot of these different features, just to point out, they're not because they were trying to be, I suppose, make the soldiers uncomfortable. It's simply because of ease of maintenance and durability in the battlefield. Now, one other upgrade I'd like to point out at this point that the 90 got over the series three Land Rovers is a single piece windscreen. Up to that point, it used to be split down the middle and there'd be two panes of glass, whereas this particular one gave you a single uh, pane windscreen. And of course that aids visibility. And I suppose a little bit of comfort and convenience as well for whoever's driving the vehicle. So let's go take a spin in this now. Okay, so when I was under the bonnet, I actually mentioned as well that there was a couple of NATO upgrades on this. Another key NATO upgrade is this particular hitch. You can see here, it's not a regular ball hitch. And this was done so that, again, there was conformity between all the different armies, but also so that they could securely attach heavy loads and be able to pull them, we'll say, across a battlefield if it ever came to that. One other upgrade I forgot to mention when I was underneath the bonnet of this Land Rover it's also important to note this particular one, again, meeting NATO standards, is EMP compliant. What does EMP stand for? Well, it stands for electromagnetic pulse. And this is one of the key important NATO features here. You only ever get an EMP in one scenario. That's in a nuclear attack. So this is nuclear war compatible. So if you get a nuclear war, if a nuclear weapon goes off, the electrics in this are so basic, there's no ECUs, that this vehicle will continue on driving. And again, anyone from any army can jump in, NATO army can jump in and drive this through a battlefield. So it's a very important point. Um, and it's also what stopped upgrades happening on these throughout its life. So as Land Rover were producing the 90 and it became the Defender and so on and so forth, it got a lot of upgrades up to 2016, including, we'll say, a TD5 engine. But Land Rover could never guarantee that the TD5 engine could withstand an electromagnetic pulse. Now, it wasn't the engine per se, it was all the electronics that went with the engine. So, you know, these are pretty tough vehicles if they can withstand a nuclear weapon. So just uh, bear that in mind the next time you look at an old Defender. Okay, so one extra important feature that comes with this particular Land Rover is an original Penman trailer. Now, these would have been used in conjunction with the, these Land Rovers. So according to the owner, if you go back and you look at video footage of the Falklands War and other battle, zone where, battle zones where these would have been deployed, you'd see these trailers loaded up with weapons, ammunition, and other items which the army would need. You'll also note up here that they come with hooks, very sturdy hooks. And there's also two more at the rear. I'll just point them out to you. There's one here and there's one on the other side. And of course, a very hefty stand as well for the trailer. Now, these would have been airlifted or lifted by crane off of ships down onto the docks 
And as I say, they could have been airlifted in by helicopter and deployed straight into a battle zone. So incredibly sturdy trailer and a, a brilliant addition. And I suppose a rare addition really in the civilian world to have with the original Defender from the British Army as well. OK, again, another little important note to note on these. Again, as I already pointed out, you have the NATO hitch, but underneath here, you also have a brake master cylinder. So these trailers also came with their own braking system because of the expected weight that they would be expected to be loaded with. And one other feature, at the rear, there's also a hook which you can attach a second trailer and a third trailer and so on and so forth and pull it across the battlefield if you so needed to do. Hiya, pup. Hiya, how are you? You're having a nice swim, aren't you? He's all right. Okay, so you're very welcome along to driving the Land Rover 90. It's probably loud, it's probably going to crash and vibrate quite a bit, but that's all part of the experience. So what can I say about it? Well, the steering weighs an absolute ton, okay? Uh, this is taking me back to my first days when I started driving. I learned to drive in a David Brown 885 tractor and it weighs as much as this to drive. Um, clutch, it's not as heavy or as clunky as I thought. DHL man would want to slow down though. Oop, over into reverse. Gearbox is a little clunkier than I thought. There we found first eventually. So again, no creature comforts in here. It's back to basics motoring, but that's the good thing about it. It's very easy to maintain, very easy to, to use. Now the owner of this particular one tells me they use it on a very, very regular basis. That they haul an awful lot of gravel with it, wood, other bits and pieces for the for the house, a lot of wood chippings, that kind of thing. It's general household chores and it's absolutely a joy to drive, it never lets them down and always, always, always grabs them attention, including an open so far as finding a local farmer in under the car one day, checking out his chassis. So a little bit of an unusual experience to have someone come and check your undercarriage, unannounced of course, all right? Other than that, as I said, it's very loud, very gruff. Um, definitely a, a work vehicle it's not built with creature comforts or any of that kind of thing in mind as you can see it's a struggle to go around the bend there without stopping um, other things to note the clutch pedal is mounted very high now that wouldn't be a big issue if you had big work boots on but I've kind of soft shoes on today and you can certainly feel it in your leg but it's certainly something if I had the right equipment on I'd be well used to driving everyone's giving me waves as I'm driving by so it obviously attracts that bit of attention the view out the front it's actually brilliant view out the front loads of loads of glass there you're right up against it as well not much distance there from it either in terms of the heater apparently it heats doesn't do a whole pile but again it's not too cold today so we're not we're not worrying too much about that the slide windows actually I love it's just nice to be able to just put your elbow out there that's kind of all you really need with it but other than that, it's exactly as you imagined it would be. Looks great. It's an experience to drive. Comfort is not one of the words though that's going to spring to your mind when you're in this. But it's great fun, I have to say. Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to take this off-road, but I do believe they're incredibly good in the, in the rough, incredibly good in mud. And of course, that's the whole reason that they were popular in the army and the services, because of course they could go anywhere and do anything. So with that, I'm going to leave you folks now. Thank you very much for joining us in John's Garage this week, and we'll talk again soon. Adios, folks.